to speak. And okay. so please use the, um, the chat function to put in your questions, put in your comments. So um, let's start, but let's start by taking a few moments to just compose ourselves, take a few moments to get back into our body. Um, so I'm going to ask all of you, wherever you are, if you're, if you're sitting comfortably, I hope you're all sitting comfortably with your feet planted firmly on the ground, to rest your hands on your chair, Close your eyes. Relax your feet. Relax your legs. Relax the base of your spine. Relax your back. Relax your shoulders. Relax your arms. Relax your hands. Relax your neck. Relax your face, your forehead, the muscles around your eyes, and relax your mind. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Take another deep breath in. Let it out. Take another deep breath in. Let it out. And now move your attention to this yogic heart region, the upper chest. Move your attention there. That's the, move your attention to your own divine light the light and energy that connects us all and that connects us to the universe. Stay there for a moment. Take a deep breath in. Release the breath. And just stay in this stillness and in this peace for a minute. Take a deep breath in, let it go. Slowly open your eyes. Welcome all. It's my pleasure to introduce the new, the, the two co-hosts of the webinar today. Um, who are going to set the scene for you on why we're here and um, move us on to our panelists. So our first speaker is uh, Bettina Baldici. Bettina is the Chief Executive Officer at the International Women's Development Agency based in Australia. Um, Bettina has tons of experience, previous experience um, in executive roles at Oxfam GB and at UNHCR. And Carol Miller is the co-executive director of Gender at Work. Carol is a feminist activist, researcher, and evaluator with more than 30 years experience working with women's rights organizations, international NGOs, research institutions, and UN agencies. Um, before joining Gender at Work, she was the Evaluation Manager at Oxfam Canada and Gender Policy Lead at Action Aid UK. So I would like now to turn it over to Bettina. Thank you so much, Sharina. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we at the International Women's Development Agency work and pay my respect to Indigenous elders past and present. And I recognize the past atrocities against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people um, of this land and that Australia was founded on the dispossession of First Nations people. 
On behalf of IWDA, I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to everyone joining today. By way of introduction, IWDA is an Australian-based organization resourcing diverse women's rights organizations, primarily in Asia and the Pacific, and contributing to global feminist movements to advance our vision of gender equality for all. We were established in 1985. We were inspired by women's rights activists committed to improving the focus and quality of development policy and practice. Our founders believe that women must be initiators, influencers, managers, and leaders of development ideas, not just targets or beneficiaries. And it is this her story that brings strengths in the form of deep, long-lasting connection with women's rights organizations, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. Increasingly, um, our efforts to do development differently sees us recognizing the issue of the development paradigm itself and focusing on systemic change as part of the global feminist movement. We see this approach as a third way between international development NGOs and women's fund. We resource the work of diverse women's rights organizations, enabling them by providing support that goes beyond money. And we make our own contribution to feminist movements, leveraging our own locational power through advocacy, knowledge creation, and knowledge translation. As a feminist organization that is part of the global feminist rights ecosystem, IWDA knows firsthand the multiple challenges of resourcing and doing change work. So I'm extremely pleased to be launching IWDA's latest resource, the Feminist Organizational Capacity Strengthening Toolkit, or FOX for short. It is indeed um, intended as a contribution to our collective work as we grapple with the difficult task um, of ensuring our organization reflect and support feminist values sustainably. So individuals and organization and the work itself um, to change um, for change can survive and actually thrive. Organizations do mobilize and structure resources to enable action. So for those of us committed to working with and through organization for feminist change, reflecting on power is core work. Challenging, enabling, expressing, and amplifying power is what we do. And yet we are part of cultures, systems, economies that structure power unequally, not separate from them. So our organizations must also be able to focus on our own change work particularly for women's rights organization where so much of our work feels and is vital and urgent. The challenges of sustaining attention to both external and internal priorities is a significant, it's a significant challenge. A few years ago, IWDA convened a workshop with 21 partners organization from across Asia and the Pacific and to delve into the challenges of working in women's rights organization. And they confirmed the importance of consolidating experiences and challenges of working as women's rights organization and the resources that support, enable and sustain this work. So we embarked on the journey to develop the Fox Toolkit, working alongside gender at work and with the generous support of the government of the Netherlands. We wanted to address the scarcity of practical resources to help organizations such as ours, such as WDA and the partners we work with to bring a feminist lens to addressing these kind of issues. Um, you know, we, this is a painful journey. Uh, we, we know that exploring and experimenting uh, is difficult and there's no template. And as such, the Fox resources are not prescriptive of what a feminist organization should look like. Rather, they actually provide framework for reflection, to pose questions, to help organizations come up with their own unique approach, empower us to experiment and embolden us to be creative and challenging and transforming uh, patriarchal thinking. Each of um, today's speakers is actually doing justice, and I want to thank them all for helping to create the kinds of organization we want to see in the world. I know IWDA can learn from this work. And I hope those of you joining today can take some insights from their reflection that will actually support you uh, in your work. So I'll now hand over to Carol from Gender at Work, who will speak more about how the resources were developed and provide further insight into the toolkit itself before hearing from our panelists. 
Thank you very much once again for being here. Very warm welcome to you all and over to you, Carol. Thanks, Bettina. It's such a pleasure for Gender at Work to be here today with IWDA and all the feminist activists who've joined to support the launch of the Feminist Organizational Capacity Strengthening Toolkit. It's a mouthful, so we, we fondly call, we, uh, call it FOX, as Bettina mentioned. Um, Gender at Work was invited to accompany IWDA on a journey of creation and experimentation in developing the suite of resources that make up the FOX Toolkit. From the time that Gender at Work was formed, we've worked with more than 150 organizations globally to support organizational learning and change processes, seeking to promote cultures of equality and inclusion. From this experience, we know that despite decades of capacity building efforts, organizations with mandates and commitments to women's rights and gender equality around the world have been plagued by scandals of abuse and harassment. We are finding that the principles, culture, power dynamics, and systems of organizations into which we pour our time and energy, indeed our souls, have remained old constructs which are ill-suited to the transformative change needed to deal with the complexities and challenges of our current realities. Our efforts to rewire, this is the term that Aruna often uses, rewire existing organizational cultures have met with some successes, but the slide back to patriarchal default mode is all too common. We are constantly asking, what will it take to build feminist organizations that are centered around cultures of equality, that promote relationships founded on love and respect, how do we build consciousness around being connected to the earth, the community, the people that we work with? As we embarked on the work with IWDA, we knew that it was essential to create a flexible approach and tools for feminist organizations to explore what feminist organizational capacity looks like from their perspectives. And from this, to imagine strategies to grow, strengthen, and transform organizations in ways that are consistent with feminist values. Walking the talk on feminist values in our organizations is not easy. We, we all know this. And creating safe, engaging spaces for reflection and strategizing is one way to bring our practice in line with our feminist values. The Fox Toolkit provides ideas on how to create and sustain these spaces. The toolkit includes six modules. Each of these modules offers a conceptual grounding in the specific area in which it focuses, a series of interactive capacity building exercises and activities, ideally undertaken in a workshop setting, and a guide to additional resources and tools. Each of the modules can be picked up and used on their own, or they can be used to structure a full organizational capacity assessment process, beginning with the capacity self-assessment module. The thinking and principles underpinning the Fox approach outlined in the backgrounder bring a feminist lens and gender and power analysis to the concept of organizational capacity. It builds on good practice examples from the sector that take a holistic approach to capacity, organizational capacity. The keep people working, keep those people working within the organizations at the center of the capacity assessment process rather than approaching it from a more technocratic or managerial lens. The gender analytical framework, um, many of you will, I hope, be familiar with it, with its four change quadrants, individual consciousness and capabilities, resources, rules and policies, and social norms of deep structure, is used throughout the Fox Toolkit to help diagnose, strategize, and map, map the hope for changes in capacity. The framework also helps to surface the less visible power dynamics and structures that contribute to toxic organizational cultures. The Feminist Facilitation Guide, another of the modules, brings together lessons and exercises on how to create safe, engaging feminist spaces for critical reflection on current organizational capacity and what it would take to build better and stronger. In planning and developing the modules, we interviewed many of the IWDA WAVE program partners to learn about their priorities in organizational 
capacity strengthening. From those interviews, we agreed with IWDA on a short list of three thematic modules with the hope that others could be developed if additional funding could be found. The themes of these modules are probably no surprise to anyone in this space. Resources for women's rights, which helps individuals and organizational teams to think collectively about resource mobilization in the context of the ecosystem of funding for women's rights work. Another is creating cultures of care and resilience, which helps to build the connections between individual and collective care and organizations with really practical examples of actions that can be taken. Another of the thematic modules is leading, governing, and being accountable, which includes a series of activities to support organizations work through the connections between feminist leadership, governance, and accountability. Each of the modules has been piloted, and we will hear later in this webinar about one organization's experience using the capacity assessment module. We're thrilled to see the Fox Toolkit launch today, and we really look forward to the discussion and to learn more about how to do better at living our feminist values in our organizations. Back to you, Aruna. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Bettina and Carol, uh, for that really, really um, useful introduction. I'm so excited about the Fox Toolkit, and I, I can't wait to hear um, Maureen, who's going to talk next, uh, Maureen Oliaro. Maureen is uh, from Kenya. She's a feminist gender um, development expert with more than 12 years of experience working on these kinds of issues, um, gender equality and women's empowerment in Africa. And um, Maureen is um, with, she's a member of FEMNET and, uh, and she, that is the African Women's Development Communication Network for those of you who um, not familiar with it. It's been around for a long time. Um, and she has experience in movement strengthening in Africa, supporting women's rights organizations to effectively conduct policy influencing and advocacy for gender equality. And Maureen, um, we're really excited to speak to you first um, because we understand that, um, that you have used the FOX toolkit um, the assessment, the capacity assessment module with 12 FEMNET members. And um, we would love to hear from you what your experience has been. How have you found it um, in, you know, how has it been useful? Um, in what ways has it helped you? How has the approach and how have the tools um, helped you particularly within the network, the, the FEMNET network? Maureen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So maybe just to um, a slight correction, we actually use the Fox Toolkit with uh, 13, 13 of our members um, spread across seven countries in Africa. And so of course, as uh, FemNet is a feminist organization, we were very keen to ensure that we were using an approach for capacity assessments that reflected you know feminist values principles er, and, and actions and so we're also very conscious of the fact that we're working with members from you know diverse countries with diverse contexts and so we invested a lot of time in ensuring that the, the fox module that we used was tailored and contextualized to uh, these various uh, countries and members that were engaging it so specifically within the toolkit, we use the self-assessment module. And for us, um, we, we viewed the, the, the toolkit and the resources therein as more than just you know, tools that we can use. We really embraced the ideology uh, behind them. So we were very keen to ensure that in the process of um, conducting the assessments, we are not leaving our members feeling inadequate or used. And so that is why we um, selected the Fox uh, resources to use. And so the process was very empowering. It was very much uh, partner and uh, member led and was simply there to facilitate and um, you know, help them um, set the scene and, and yeah. So the 13, partners that we worked with, the 13 members that we supported um, 
using this approach are all women rights organizations, but they are specifically women rights organizations that are network or membership based. So they come with a very uh, diverse uh, constituent and um, you know they ranged from organizations that are working with young feminists to those working with women in media, those working on issues around violence against women and some working in uh, women econ economic empowerment. So in terms of thematic focus for the 13 organizations, um, it was quite broad and varied, but all working towards um, promoting uh, gender equality within the continent. In terms of the actual process um, for each of the organizations in each of the seven countries, we had a four day, um, a four day physical meeting, assessments. And because we're approaching this also from a movement strengthening um, position, then we dedicated the first day of the Fox assessments to setting the scene around movement strengthening. So having discussions with those members and their constituents around you know, sharing on their stories on the journey of the women's movement in that country. So what are the highs, what are the lows, what the future looks like. And we felt that that first day really helped to situate the entire process within that broader movement strengthening um, agenda. Then the rest of the three days were now dedicated to using the module itself, going through the various capabilities, um, of course, highlighting the strengths of all these organizations, but also taking some time to look at what's needed uh, most more working on what, what the gaps were. And by the end of those four days, we had a very robust capacity strengthening plans for each of these um, 13 FEMNET members. And FEMNET has been supporting them to implement some of those um, actions in the capacity strengthening plans. But they're also using the plans as resource mobilization aids to uh, secure resources you know, from other funding partners. Um, and something that we noted uh, during the entire process that the institutional and operational capacities of most women rights organizations are normally not an area of investment by funding partners. And so, and of course, it, 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 it all goes back to the lens by which these capacities are viewed. So you'll find that most of the women rights organizations are deemed as lacking these capacities because the yardstick that is being used to assess those capacities are those of funding partners. And so there is a lot of need to ensure that funding partners are investing in uh, enhancing uh, those operational capacities, but are also having an open mind and are being more um, inclusive in terms of what are these eligibility criteria that are put forth for women rights organizations to qualify for funding. We'll notice that most of the funding partners, um, the processes that they use um, in attracting um, bids for funding, for example, are very Northern centric, very exclusionary. And so during the Fox process, it really heightened our awareness of how much we need to engage funding partners in ensuring that um, they are being more intentional and actually walking the talk when they say that we want money to reach women rights organizations in the, in the continent. So one of the things that we are working on as a next step from the Fox assessment is that we are currently conducting a study that is collating and analyzing the key capacity strengths and gaps among women rights organizations in Africa and more importantly, making recommendations on how a movement strengthening up to addressing, to addressing these gaps uh, would look like. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, Maureen has really highlighted a very important point that I think is very common to all of us, to feminist organizations and women's rights organizations around the world. And that is that there's, um, there's not enough focus and resources that go into 
the institutional strengthening of the organizations themselves. <clears throat> and you've raised a very important challenge that, um, that there needs to be more focus on this. There needs to be an open dialogue uh, with, with, um, with donors and other, um, and, and access to resources to actually uh, work on these. And it's really interesting to hear your experience about how you used the tool to enable you to, you know, come to this um, and to define very clearly what your capacity needs are. So thank you, Maureen. I'd like to now turn to um, Anna Pekova. Anna is a women's rights advocate based in Mexico City and um, currently is the director of Prospera International, the, the Prospera International Network of Women's Funds. And I'm sure, Anna, you've faced this issue, you've come across this issue in your work. Um, I know that you have worked in um, on previously on sexual and reproductive rights in Mexico and um, Sector America with the Ford Foundation. Um, and these issues that Maureen raised are common to um, women's rights and feminist organizations around the world. So, um, I'd like to ask you, Anna, if you could reflect from your experience with Prospera, um, what lessons do you have? What can you share with us about this critical dialogue that Maureen was talking about? Um, how to build a capacity to mobilize resources in ways that actually shift that power dynamic between the donor and the partner? Um, in this funding landscape for women's rights and feminist organizations and networks. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Aruna. Thank you so much for the introduction. Just a small uh, precision. Uh, I'm a deputy director at Prospera. We do have a fabulous executive director who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today. Uh, uh, I also wanna thank the organizers, the International Women's Development Agency, uh, uh, and uh, also gender at work. Uh, thank you so much for creating an opportunity to have this uh, important conversation and, and congratulations on, uh, on a fabulous toolkit that I'm sure will be very uh, widely used. Um, it's a great question actually Aruna and I wanna start a little bit by saying a couple of words about uh, the context and, and where does this need uh, to strengthen our capacity uh, to mobilize resources come from. Uh, Despite growing commitments to gender equality by all funders in the world, by agencies and governments, uh, only a small uh, portion of funding actually reaches women's rights organizations. Um, as it is mentioned um, also in the resource mobilization tool document, which is presented here today, uh, it is less than 1% actually of OECD gender equality funds, which go directly uh, to women's rights organizations. Um, so uh, the change that we seek and this gender equality that we talk about requires strong movements uh, and movements need resources. Activists and organizations uh, who are at the forefront of social change need more resources. Now, in addition to the need for more resources, uh, there is also another problem. We also need better resources for gender equality. Much of the funding continues to be earmarked. Uh, it is often channeled through multilateral institutions, through large international organizations. Uh, there is also an important trust uh, gap um, as documented by a recent report from the Human Rights Funders Network where global North funders provide more restricted forms of funding to recipients in the global South and East or not funding them at all. Uh, so where is Prospera in this context? Um, Prospera is a network of 44 independent women's funds uh, which support women, girls and trans persons movements and organizations uh, in over 170 countries in the world. Women's funds are strategically positioned. They're close to movements, close to organizations on the ground, and they provide support through financial grants, capacity building, and also networking. Uh, it's a quite unique model of, of funding um, uh, where funders do not bring forward an agenda, but they rather work to listen movements uh, to identify the needs that require resources. Women's funds, 
they're the only uh, or the main funder often of groups which are traditionally under researched, um, including sex workers, including HIV positive women, formerly incarcerated women, uh, indigenous women. Uh, and they're also unique in that they provide support to small organizations, to groups which are often not formally registered. So in the context that I just described as a network, as a political network of women's funds, we have identified a very important need to strengthen our capacity uh, individually, but also collectively to mobilize more and better resources for feminist movements and organizations. And to that end, we recently launched a resource mobilization program. Um, this is an initiative which parts from the idea that amongst all of the different funds which are part of the network and all of us which operate in different contexts, we have the knowledge, we have the contacts to support ourselves to continue to grow uh, and serve better uh, movements and organizations. Um, this collective space, collective learning space has been an opportunity for uh, us as a network to talk about, you know, the traditional relationships amongst uh, women and money, uh, to talk about the need to diversify funder space, um, also to learn and to adapt on how to mobilize resources in the current hyper online world. Um, and we're soon to embark on a conversation uh, on, you know, what is the use and how can you use communications to support resource mobilization efforts. And I wanted here to take advantage of this space uh, to share with you some of the uh, main lessons uh, from this journey. Um, and I had an opportunity to have a look at the resource mobilization tool, uh, which is being uh, presented as part of the organizational assessment toolkit. Uh, and I was thrilled to see how well it captures, uh, you know, our journey and so many of the lessons that uh, we came across as well um, as we were developing and implementing this resource mobilization program. Um, one of the first things that I want to say uh, is that resources mobilization is not only about fundraising. It is also political work. Uh, and it has to do with how we go about changing attitudes changing norms, changing behaviors, how we use um, our unique value as women's funds, as funders close to the movement to convey a message that funding needs to follow movements, not the other way around. Uh, it's not movements that need to follow funding. Now, doing this work collectively is much easier than doing it individually. And the resource mobilization program helped us not only to strengthen our individual capacities, but also it created opportunities for us to acknowledge that, you know, we have a collective power uh, to raise resources, but also to shift power within the current funding ecosystem and seek to position ourselves as intermediaries, uh, not only as intermediaries, but as peers, as equal players, you know, with other funders in the current uh, funding ecosystem. The resources mobilization uh, program, the conversations that, that happen uh, in this space have also um, demonstrated um, a very important need for us to have more clarity in terms of what our unique value is. What do we bring to the table, you know, and, 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 and what do we use to raise resources, uh, as well as why do we raise resources? get to know ourselves better. And I think it is important to have that uh, very clear. Um, another lesson has to do with the fact that resource mobilization is not something that happens in an isolated box. Um, it has a, a very strong advocacy aspect to it. Uh, it is based on strong male knowledge. Uh, it requires powerful communication tools. And it is important that we approach it like that, you know, and in systems, in a comprehensive and an institutional uh, manner. Um, also resources mobilization takes resources. Uh, and as women's funds, we always, we continuously face a challenge, you know, uh, we're continuously struggling to raise and, and give more resources to movements, you know? So we often um, struggle to accept that, you know, women's funds also need resources to raise more resources, that in order to do good resource mobilization, you need 
um, you need good research, you need professional staff, uh, you need strong coordination, and, and that requires uh, resources. And I just wanted to share that um, here with you. And I guess one of the uh, one of the main takeaways for us, you know, and and especially Prospera being being a network, being a feminist network, political network, was, uh, you know, how important it is to constantly ask ourselves questions about power dynamics uh, and about resource distribution within our own network. You know, how um, how important it is to continue deepening collaboration. Uh, support each other uh, in developing resilience um, and, and how to move from, uh, you know, competition to um, collaboration, um, how to turn, you know, the, uh, the solidarity that we have in the network is our, our strongest asset and how we can use that to open up a very important conversation about, you know, um, inequalities in terms of resources within our own uh, network. Um, and just to finalize my my intervention, um, this really has been has been a journey. It has been um, a learning uh, journey. Um, uh, you know how you do resource mobilization, how you do feminist uh, resource uh, mobilization, um, uh, the importance of constantly asking ourselves those questions, um, uh, especially in in a context which which changes uh, with new challenges. Um, uh, and, and, and part of the resilience is, you know, to, to demonstrate that we can adapt. Um, uh, we hated, we hated it that, you know, all of this work and all of these conversations had to happen uh, online. But at the same time, we realized that, you know, this is how the world looks like uh, today. And much of the resource mobilization and conversations that we have uh, happen, happen online. Uh, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and, and once again, congratulations to a, a great resource. We look forward to to use it and to share it in the network and also with with grantee partners. Back to you, Aruna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think you've raised a really important point that women's funds not only do they reach a very particular uh, and important constituency that other donors don't necessarily reach but also that women's funds themselves need resources to do the kind of work that they're trying to do to support this kind of constituency. So that, you know, we forget about that sometimes and it's very important to remember. Um, and, you know, shifting that power balance, as you said, is uh, it, it's quite a, a complex process. And um, you've pointed out that, you know, that resource mobilization itself needs resources, which is, you know, a bit of a catch-22, because as Maureen said, uh, many of these organizations that desperately need the resources um, for institutional capacity to do the kind of MEL and the advocacy that, Anna, you're talking about, um, you know, that, that capacity is not necessarily there. Um, I want to just acknowledge, take a moment to acknowledge um, we have uh, lots of people who have joined us and I'm so happy to see that there are people from all over the world. Um, I've just was looking and we've got South Africa, we've got uh, the UK, we've got Brazil, we have uh, Mexico, Sweden, Italy, thank you all. We're really happy to have you join us. And um, please, as you're listening to uh, the discussion and questions come up, please um, remember to Put those into the the chat function. Um, I also want to acknowledge they were uh, right up front. I think Susanna, Freed, and others said that they couldn't access the um, the Fox toolkit, but now I see that Lisa has um, made that available. Sent a, a link, so you should all have that link, and you will be able to access this really incredible toolkit. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Melanie Lindayan. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Melanie. Um, Melanie is a uh, feminist activist and program officer at the Equality Fund. And um, the Equality Fund, as many of you will know, is in Canada. It's a new fund. It's one that um, all of us look to as... Um, in fact, applying and using uh, these feminist principles in its work um, and in its approach to grant making. So 
Melanie, if I could, I'd like you to ask us uh, to tell us a little bit about um, the Equalities Fund's accompaniment approach. You know, you've heard, we've heard from Maureen and Anna um, different as about different aspects of the resource mobilization kind of conundrum. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind your approach, particularly to um, uh, capacity building uh, and what are you learning from your own grantees um, about this, this issue? Melanie, over to you. Thank you so much, Aruna. Um, and just to start with, I'm based in Hamilton, Canada on traditional lands and waters of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and huron wendat nations. Um, and some really appreciate this question. Um, I, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get to dive into this in, in this conversation, hosted by Gender at Work and IWDA and a roster of leaders and friends of the Quality Fund from, from across our ecosystem, um, just acknowledging um, many of whom have contributed to our model and, and, and to our grant making approaches. So I'm, I'm also really excited about the launch of the, the Fox resource modules. Um, and, um, and and exercises and, and the intentionality um, of, uh, of of the um, uh, of the toolkit, which is really aligned with with our approach, um, which is um, a feminist accompaniment and capacity strengthening approach rooted in uh, shifting power for mutual accountability um, and and accountability to feminist movements. So our our, um, our capacity strengthening uh, approach. Um, it, with our partners is uh, what we call our, our grant making plus um, and it's really focused on strategic partner accompaniment which goes beyond funding um, and speaks to the active listening component that um, um, that um, uh, that was introduced um, uh, and um, uh, for us um, and 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 uh, sister organizations this is a uh, learning uh, about how to support uh, the survival and growth of chronically underfunded women's organizations um, and strengthening networks of support um, through our multi-year and responsive funding and um, a grant making plus component, which is immediate support, advocacy and capacity strengthening activities. So the philosophy uh, and the process is really guided by partners needs and, and priorities uh, based on a um, uh, an onboarding process um, and on an ongoing uh, relationship throughout the grant cycle of self assessment and re and reflections, um, where our, our our partners and their teams are um, are um, reflecting and uh, expressing strategic needs and organizational priorities, which inform how we're co planning um, together. Um, on, on how we support or accompany their, their expressed needs. Um, so this, this is so dependent on, uh, on trust building, uh, the active listening and collaboration with our partners um, and the accompaniment strategies and value added are linked to exchange and leveraging diverse resources, which, um, uh, for, for which coordination across movements uh, around opportunities um, and, and, and skills uh, with, within and across movements is, is so important. So, um, so, so some of the key offerings that we are, um, uh, that we have, have been um, uh, prioritizing based, uh, based on key capacity areas that we've identified uh, overlap really strongly with the FOX module themes. Um, so specifically some key areas include strengthening visibility, and, um, and communications, uh, amplifying partners' voices and knowledge leadership um, in, in strategic spaces. And of course, um, sharing funding opportunities and, um, and resource uh, support for resource mobilization through proposal processes, um, re relaying and, and uh, fostering exchange of, um, uh, of uh, a range of capacity strengthening tools and opportunities, um, including strategies for protection, uh, digital hygiene and holistic security, um, including emotional supports, um, and um, uh, these being aspects of, um, uh, of, of collective care, uh, which we are, you know, this is, this is a non-exhaustive list 
um, because it is uh, so uh, so important to have uh, tailored and um, um, and um, iterative approach to uh, defining resources and um, and building and um, uh, and uh, uh, shifting as needed these um, the the capacity strengthening planning to together with partners and um, and and movements. Um, so, uh, so some of the work that we're looking into um, that we're that we are um, continuing to build and design is is related to how how we facilitate opportunities for network and alliance building. Um, so, um, this um, uh, some areas that we've um, that we've moved that we've advanced in uh, recent cycles are. are uh, um, workshops and exchange around feminist monitoring, evaluation, and learning um, support for uh, reporting uh, beyond fulfilling our our, our, uh, our own reporting mechanisms, but also supporting partners and strengthening capacity for uh, reporting and communicating the impact uh, of their work, um, not just within the ecosystem. Um, uh, but uh, but beyond um, thinking, especially of um, the um, uh, the limitations for uh, many of these uh, groups, which are uh, which are particularly intersectional. Um, so um, I I just wanted to note uh, that um, these these approaches, uh, which uh, are, are rely so strongly on the relationships and individual accompaniment, um, also. Um, uh, also take on a portfolio or cohort approach, um, which I think is uh, is a key area um, where um, uh, where the resource modules are are, are interesting and um, the opportunity for um, for coordinating uh, within within ecosystem for um, uh, for having having coordinated and strategic approaches to. Um, uh, to uh, partnership accompaniments uh, for capacity strengthening um, is it is that that's really key. Um, so um, the the challenge of this being um, the the wide range um, of uh, uh, regional and thematic work uh, that our that our partners are doing. Um, this is um, both a uh, this is the um, uh, this is the richness of uh, of our partners' work. Um, and, and also uh, requires the really deep uh, learning and, and listening um, and, um, and, and, and data collection from um, uh, of, and gathering of learnings um, as we're onboarding our, our next, uh, our, our first cycles of partners and incorporating um, the learnings uh, and, and strategies uh, from previous cycles. So it really is an iterative exercise. Um, and um, I think particularly in this time of pandemic around um, where um, uh, all women's rights and feminist organizations globally have been struggling to survive on, um, on so many levels um, to sustain themselves individually and organizationally. Um, it's, been, um, it's been a test um, uh, of the flexibility of our grant making approaches, um, the ability to streamline our processes um, to advance new formats um, like, like audio reporting, to um, to find opportunities for um, uh, for uh, movement building and interactive uh, 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 platforms, uh, which are accessible in um, in the virtual landscape. Um, so I, I I'm really encouraged by um, this this conversation and um, and the, the launch of the modules. Um, I. I, I wanted to pick up a little bit if um, uh, if uh, if the time is uh, is still with us um, about um, uh, the importance of finding new language and ways of thinking about partnership ac accompaniment um, that incorporate holistic security um, and feminist collective care strategies um, because um, it it um, you know as as um, um, uh, as other speakers were saying, um, we are um, in this movement of of uh, of needing uh, of, of the challenge of resourcing um, uh, women's funds and and the ecosystem itself, and learning at the same time to cultivate our own cultures of uh, of collective care, 
navigating what it means to model feminist uh, self-care uh, and collective care strategies internally and in partnership. Um, and uh, just it's, it's a personal reflection on acknowledging that the, the challenge of that modeling, um, modeling collective care um, in, in relationship with partners, acknowledging the power dynamics as a funder um, in, in relation to the context of um, uh, the, the really diverse context of our partners. Um, so so uh, to, uh, to address Aruna, the, um, the second part of your question, uh, there, there are so many um, key learnings from our partners um, which have really focused um, uh, in, in, in what, from what we're hearing recently on communications and advocacy, uh, resource mobilization and leveraging networks and movement building as the top priorities for capacity strengthening. So this really, this really speaks to um, um, the, the, the focus of the, the toolkit um, and, um, and, and how, um, how critical it is for um, uh, collaborative ongoing accompaniment, which is, um, uh, which is uh, resourced and, and coordinated um, uh, among um, uh, among from, uh, among the ecosystem. Uh, Thank you so and, much. And informed by partners, um, partners' uh, experiences themselves in an ongoing way. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, it's it's um, you know it's it's very useful and interesting to hear um, about the um, Equality Fund itself, sort of having to learn you know, about how to be feminist, how to accompany grantees in a feminist way, in a collaborative way. Um, so you're, you, you know, you're in a way going through the same, same process, uh, uh, you know, in a, a different context, of course, but in the same process that many of the women's rights and feminist organizations and feminist networks are themselves going through. So thank you so much um, for sharing that experience. I'd like to now turn to um, Adriana Kachun and Nina George. Um, both Adriana and Nina are from the Oak Foundation. Adriana leads Oak's work on organizational development and capacity building. And her role at Oak is to shape the capacity building strategy of the foundation to support program staff in assessing grantees readiness for capacity building including conducting capacity assessments of grantees. And so Adriana, the, this, this Fox tool, it kind of is right up your alley and very interested to hear um, about your, how you think about you know, these issues and, and about this and being introduced to this tool. Um, Nina is a program officer with um, issues affecting women's program at the Oak Foundation. Um, she will speak after Adriana. And she is developing a portfolio on psychological violence using her 20 years plus experience in frontline, um, supporting frontline organizations in tackling male violence against women and children. So if I could um, ask both of you, and if you would go first, Adriana, um, it's very interesting, of course, and um, for us to know as women's rights activists, and feminists from feminist organizations that the Oak Foundation, in fact, takes this issue very seriously, that you devote, you know, 20% of um, your funding to capacity building. And um, we've heard a lot already from, you know, Maureen, from Anna, from, um, from Melanie about, you know, the need, the, the need for this from the partner perspective. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit about your own thinking at Oak about this, you know, why you do this, um, and discuss some of the challenges you've come across in um, taking on a feminist uh, grantee-led approach to capacity building. Over to you. Thank you, Aruna, and thank you for the thank you for the invitation to be here. As you said, this is very much up my street. I come from Eastern Europe, where I worked with nonprofit organizations, and one of the first 
most interesting projects actually that I did in the field of capacity development was to design a self-assessment tool for organizations in Eastern Europe. So it's very, it's very good to, to see this. It's very good to see that these kind of tools are, are needed and used by the field because otherwise they wouldn't be created, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be there. Um, if, uh, just as a very, very brief introduction, Oak Foundation is a family-led foundation. We have main offices in Geneva, London, and North Carolina in the new US, and we grant around $300 million a year um, split for seven different um, work areas, one of which is issues affecting women. And my colleague Nina is part of that team and she will be talking more about um, what, what they do in terms of uh, grant making and, and capacity building. Um, generally at Oak and very interesting, our capacity building work started back in 2011. It was a grantee driven work. We had a grantee perception survey, the first ever uh, done by Oak with Center for Effective Philanthropies. We wanted to hear from our grantees about how we perform as a, as a foundation when it comes to grant making. And interestingly enough, they came back to us and they said, thank you for your money. We very much appreciate it, but could you do more? And that is, this is where they actually asked us to uh, provide capacity development support. So support beyond program grants. We were already engaged in a little capacity development work, but um, in response, Oak realized that, okay, we have to ramp up this work. And they started by setting up this position of senior advisor. Again, my title as advisor, you know, is not manager, is really advisor. I don't go in the field to work with the organizations. I'm trying to understand what are their needs to use tools such as self-assessment tools or encourage them to use those tools to self-discover what are the challenges, but also what are their strengths, because we don't want to only address the challenges, but we also want to build on, on their strengths. So, so these kind of tools are very important, very important to us as a foundation. So they, this is it is an advisor. So I am there to be, you know, a partner thinking very much like, um, like Melanie was saying, a partner in thinking, in, discuss, in discussing, and in self-discovery. So I support program officers. So our, our main work is still grant making. So 80%, 85% of the money still goes to implementing projects and, and programs. Um, so my role is to support program officers and programs in developing strategies and skills to support capacity development because all the capacity development money goes through the programs. We don't have a grant making for organizational development as such. It's very discreet in supporting, in supporting programs and projects. So, and then the other part of my work is, as I said, to work directly with grantees and clusters in helping to identify needs, design interventions and, and recommending support. So this was the starting point like eight, eight and a half years ago. Um, and while I, I want to strengthen a little bit this grantee driven capacity development work, because while we as a foundation have set up a capacity building strategy, more like principles, which are the foundation of our capacity development work, every program determines their own level of capacity building engagement, which is commensurate with their program priorities, their grantee portfolio, depending, the, depending on the geographies where they are uh, where they are working. And you will probably hear from Nina, my colleague, how the issues affecting women is doing that in practice in one of their, one of their geographies. One important thing to also mention is that in our capacity building work, we are not aiming to build the perfect organization. Actually, I don't believe that perfect organization exists. It's an effective organization which allows it to attain its objectives and achieve their mission. So really is to support them to that extent, not forcing anything to the extent where they become more effective and efficient and they are happy, happily achieving their, uh, their mission. 
So what are some of these principles which I was talking about? We, and which is very much linked to the, to the self-assessment tool, we encourage grantees to identify and address their own capacity development needs, to basically fully own the strengthening work, even if sometimes we as a donor can flag some challenges which we see from the outside. So because program officers have very long relationships with grantees, we are we we stay with grantees for five to ten years. So we we develop trust, which we believe is very important in in this capacity development role. So they they develop these relationships and they are they they start to play a significant role in catalyzing capacity building in in the grantees. So as I said, this is around conversations, but also is around discussions around capacity development needs, which are happening sometimes near to the end of the grant because we are starting to discuss financial sustainability when funding is ending or before a renewal of a grant where the needs are clearer and the program officer and the grantee understand better uh, the areas where they need support. So I'm also conscious of the time because I want to split it uh, half half with, uh, with Nina, my colleague. Um, more, what are some specific triggers for change are also not only the grant renewals, but of course, as I said, we are very aware of the environment in which the grantees actually work. So they can be uh, changes in the external environment, which are big triggers, for example, violence and political risk for women's organizations in Brazil or funding cuts to BME groups in the UK or anti-abortion movement in Italy or Central Europe activists being targeted. So we, we try to stay attuned and therefore we believe that it's very important that the organizations themselves actually get help from us. We are there to provide the funding and the advice to identify the needs, to design and co-develop if they need with our help or with, a, with the help of consultants, their development plans and we are there to, to, to fund those. So I'll stop here and um, I'll let Nina also take the floor and maybe give an example from, from their own portfolio. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, in the interest of being quite quickly here and filling the time, I'm gonna give you an example of the Issues Affecting Women program and how we've worked in the Western Balkans. And within that outlined three of the tensions that we've come across just in, in this situation. So we were making grants of around about 20 organizations in the area, and we couldn't keep doing this as a team. We were a small team. So we set up an intermediary agreement with the TRAG Foundation. And this started with capacity building, thinking about capacity building before regranting in 2014. Now, obviously, this is seven years pre-Fox. So we were struggling to find something that was decent. And had we been doing this all this had we been in this situation now, we could have used this amazing toolkit. So that would have been a great start. As it was, we adapted one from the US and we looked at compliance with our demands at Oak in terms of what we needed for financial, organizational health, but also for child protection, which is something that our, um, our foundation has a very strong kind of view on. Um, we also looked at organizational development areas and then TRAG Foundation visited people and did workshops as well to kind of fine tune the process. So already this brings up tension number one, which is the difference between meeting a funder's needs and meeting your own organizational development needs. And I think this is a, this is a huge tension. So 2015, the regranting started. Um, and TRAG have done this kind of expertly. They developed a toolbox. So for example, they had things like for every 5% of the funding that an organization put towards its capacity building, TRAG matched it. Um, they developed peer learning. So if somebody was really good at writing European commission proposals, for example, or attracting and keeping volunteers, they would run sessions for each other on that. They did team or group capacity building learning. So they had uh, sessions on advocacy, on holistic security. And meanwhile, TRAG itself 
wasn't necessarily a feminist organization. So while they are helping their grantee partners and our grantee partners to develop, they're actually main gender mainstreaming as well. So they are developing their work as well. And I think this is a key learning that there's learning alongside that's happening here. Uh, 2019, they had an evaluation of the capacity building. By now, 40 groups are um, funded by Oak through the TRAG Foundation. Um, but interestingly, within that evaluation, 40% of the groups are still finding it difficult to find the time or the resources to do any capacity building. And I think this is tension number two. This is even though issues affecting women gives core support generally, that still to have the time and the energy for planning uh, and for creating resources when you're offering frontline or emergency services is really difficult. Um, or in individual organizations were strengthened. They had a clear strategy. They had more donors, better structures. But tension number three, the professionalism has increased, but the connectivity and the movement has weakened somewhat. And this is a really interesting. So TRAG have again reimagined capacity building and they're looking at ways of having uh, joint efforts, joint grants, care, resources and mobilization alongside individual capacity building, which covers things such as a successful financial exit process, which I do think is amazing, can talk to that in questions. And they've co-designed this with their grantee partners. And on top of that, the IT team who are working on the platform are all women. So we're creating a group of women IT kind of experts, bringing them together so they can develop as well. It's really quick, but I just wanted to give you all some examples of how these kind of things weave into each other, but also the tensions they raise. So I know we've gone over and I really thank you for that. So thank you, Aruna. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you very much. Um, your examples are really helpful because uh, it gives people a, a direct sense of, you know, what that actually looks like on the ground. Um, I, uh, I see that we've got some time now for um, question and answers, comments. Uh, we have three questions and, and I'm going to um, going to ask the, the panelists and the panelists, if I could ask you to turn on your, your videos um, at this moment so that um, I can see your wonderful faces and everybody can. Um, and uh, I would encourage those of you who are listening, if, you, if there are questions that come up for you to please put them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to address as many as possible. Um, there's a, the first question, um, is, is around, and I, I'm going to try to get to all, but we'll, we'll see how, how it goes in terms of time. Um, the first question is, is really a fundamental one. You know, we have, all of you have raised this issue about um, the need for building capacity of and strengthening um, the capacity of women's rights organizations and feminist organizations and networks, ability to mobilize resources, ability to assess their own needs um, and you've also raised, you know, uh, I remember Anna was saying that specifically in her um, presentation that, in fact, the resources available for doing this are still very small. Um, and and Shauna asks, uh, Shauna Walsh, there's a question from Shauna Walsh, and Shauna asks, um, how do you think this toolkit um, can be used to, in fact, catalyze the discussion for further financing in this area, in this area that is a huge area. Um, how can the toolkit be used? How do you think the toolkit can be used for catalyzing further resources in the area of institutional strengthening? Um, can I ask Bettina? Bettina, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I'll start and maybe uh, others will add, maybe Carol and others will add, I think. Um, I would say the self-assessment module is uh, is the key module in the toolkit for this. IWDA uh, did test uh, the toolkit uh, and the self-assessment module specifically uh, a couple of years ago, and it surfaced for us uh, a number of areas that we needed to be prioritizing and working on uh, for our organization. And in fact, interestingly, I will share a bit of a story around our own journey in the past 18 months where 
uh, connected actually to the uh, areas of strengthening that we needed to focus on. We have been putting um, quite a lot of work over the past 18 months into what it means for our organization to really decolonize its practice and what it means for our organization to be an anti-racist organization. And in that process, actually working through those self-assessment where it has catalyzed conversations that we've been unable to bring to some of our funders uh, and be very open and direct with our funders to say, actually, if we wanna be the next best version of ourselves, these are the areas that we as an organization need to work on. And, uh, and I want to echo some of what I heard Adriana say, actually the trust that was built in the relationship with our funder established over a number of years where they'd been funding us to do other work with our grantees and with our partners actually really uh, was a catalyst for, for them being able to see, okay, you've done your self-assessment, you see what you need to be focusing on, and we're going to uh, put investment and trust in you. And I would say we intend to later this year, early next year, go back to the self-assessment to look at the organizational culture review that we're doing to actually use this as a milestone point uh, to see whether we are achieving what we said set out to achieve. Um, Thank maybe you. Others want to add in their own experience. Thank you so much, Bettina. That's a really important point around how, you know, the, the results of the tool being able being used as a bridge to, for dialogue between um, donors and partners. Would would you like to comment on that, Adriana or Anna? Adriana? Shortly, yes. Um, I think our my colleagues, the program officers, so they are the guys with the money um, in the programs and with the strategies. I think they would be super thrilled if they would get an application, which is not only about implementing a program or implementing a strategy, but really also implementing an institutional strengthening Part. So using that money to 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 do institutional strengthening and what we what because we do a lot of core support lately, like Nina said, we really shifted our we are trying very hard to shift a lot of our funding into core support. And that means supporting the implementation of the of the strategies of our grantees. We encourage grantees when they design a strategy, uh, a strategy to not only think about the program, but to think about the organization. What do I need? What kind of organization do I need to be in order to implement this program of the organization for the next year or three years and put it in the strategy, make it part of the strategy and raise funds for it. So um, I am, you know, I'm talking in the, you know, in, in the name of my colleagues, the program officer, but I'm, I'm sure they would be thrilled if they would see, you know, asking, if they would see grantees asking for organizational development support based on a needs assessment or based on whatever they have done to, you know, to uncover what, uh, what strengthening measures they need. Thank you so much, Adriana. Um, would Anna, would you like to comment on that? Carol, you have your hand up. Carol, would you like to go first? Anna, let Anna go first and then- Okay, I'll... Anna first. No, I don't mind, Carol. Okay, just very, very quickly. Uh, I think one thing that we're seeing is that women's rights organizations, they need long-term, flexible support, core support. And, and I absolutely agree, you know, this is a trust issue. You know, we need to start doing grant making based on trust. Um, I know sometimes there is real challenges. Uh, and there is one of the questions actually uh, asked about what do you do if you are a recently formed organization, if you're just starting up, you know, and there is real challenges uh, when you are a new organization to how much funding you can access and also funders, you know, they cannot give grants to that sort of organizations. Women's funds uh, can play an important role there. They can play a role to close that gap. Uh, they work with many organizations um, who are just starting or which have not have been formally registered. Uh, and women's funds provide uh, not only financial assistance, but also accompaniment for capacity building. Uh, and I think also many of us sitting here are funders. Um, and I think you know th there is an issue how 
we maintain constant communication, how we talk amongst each other. And I think these questions, they only give uh, more value to this sort of spaces, like the one uh, that, that brings us together now. You know, how do we, uh, as different types of funders working on different levels, can maintain communication and, and make sure that information, uh, what we hear from organizations on the ground, how that information can flow and how we can cover uh, all, of the, all of the needs. Carol, Thank you, Anna. Back to Thank you. you. Thank you. Carol. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Aruna. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on a point that was raised by Shauna related to measuring the success of the capacity strengthening. And I think one of the things when we, when we were developing the capacity assessment tool, we knew that often these capacity assessment processes are sort of done in a vacuum or they're, they're not grounded or connected to any organizational processes. And one of the things about the capacity assessment um, tool and the process that it supports is that it really is um, you know, done at a moment in time, it, it develop, it provides uh, exercises to prioritize and develop some sort of a capacity building plan. And it also, embeds in the process a monitoring framework for coming keep coming back to the priorities and there's actually an ability to create some sort of quantitative measures in terms of coming back each year and looking at how you're um, scoring based on what you were scoring previously um, and just in that in so just to say that it is you know, already built into the, the toolkit, there is an effort to, to embed it in monitoring and evaluation systems within an organization and to keep coming back annually to look at sort of change over time, obviously based uh, using a sort of cont uh, contextualized, you know, reflection process. And just on one final point in that regard is the um, Maureen, and maybe Maureen can speak to this directly. One thing she um, didn't mention was that when she worked with those 13 partners, it was for a baseline um, study <laughs> to use the Fox, um, capacity assessment tool for a baseline study for um, you know measuring the beginning where they were at at the beginning of a broad capacity building program that was um, you know donor funded. But perhaps Maureen would like to speak to that. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Maureen. Would you like to speak about this point? Sorry, I'll have to go off video just to um, manage my, my bandwidth. I, I wanted to add on to the point that Bettina made. Um, was it Bettina? Um, around being having that direct approach and um, being brave enough to call out on call. Call out the donor um, funding partners when it comes to the double standards. So we, there are very clear good work that women rights organizations are doing in terms of impact and, you know, um, tipping the landscape when it comes to gender equality. But then on the other hand, they are not as willing um, to support those organizations to remain uh, sustainable, to remain in operation. So we need to be able to um, call out on uh, funding partners for them to be able to, um, you know, provide that that support that is really necessary. With the thirteen partners that we worked in, we worked with, we had allocated a pot of funding to support their capacity strengthening plans. But once we went through the Fox process, we were able to increase that money, and we were only able to do that because we approached the donor and told them that this is what has come up, and what you had put in place is not going to be sufficient. And through that, we were able to access more funding to support them in terms of institutional and uh, operational capacities uh, support. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, so, so that's really a, a, a good example of how the, the tool actually enable that kind of mobilization and collective voice of women's rights organizations to, to actually address their funders on this. Um, there's another question which is uh, touches on <clears throat> a number of points that have been made earlier, and it's about um, the spaces for um, collective resource mobilization uh, on capacity building and institutional strengthening. And, and all of you know that for, and Maureen has pointed this out, you know, um, as she's spoken about the, the, the organizations that they've worked with that on, on this with this tool, many feminist organizations and many women's rights organizations 
um, are facing uh, incredible challenges of being able to sustain their programmatic work and to sustain themselves in this context. And, you know, Adriana, you raised this issue about um, the context being at the moment now, particularly, it's a very tough context for women's rights organizations and feminist networks to survive. Um, and there are specifics around um, uh, country contexts where you have backlash, you have uh, neo-nationalist governments, you have civil spaces shrinking. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, Anna pointed out right at the beginning, the actual funding going to these organizations is really, is minuscule, right? We all know this and, and we're facing it in a particular moment. And so um, the question is around, um, how can we imagine or can we imagine collective spaces for resource mobilization for this kind of capacity building, um, for uh, supporting these organizations, for um, supporting the kinds of feminist actors who are uh, doing this kind of advocacy for resource mobilization. Um, so a little bit thinking, you know, it was it was wonderful to hear, Adriana, you say that um, your program officers at Oak Foundation would love to get this kind of a proposal um, from grantees. Many of the organizations who are going to be on this call are not Oak grantees. Um, you know, so for many of those organizations, and they may be small organizations who don't necessarily have that access, can, um, you know, can we think about collective ways of trying creating spaces for this conversation to happen about collective resource mobilization? Who would like to address that? Adriana, do you want to pick that one up? It's, it shows our hesitancy shows how difficult it is actually to, and I'm, I'm trying to think you know, where we, we had a, just a small example, we tried and we incubated about three years ago, a project called the Nonprofit Builder, which was supposed to be like a market marketplace for capacity development for nonprofits, doesn't matter, feminist, human rights. And um, we had conversations with a lot of donors and I have to tell you, it was, impossible to uh, to uh, to convince uh, to put resources in capacity development, especially for organizations who are not their their grantees. Although if you talk with donors who are engaged in capacity development, like the bigger ones, you know, the Packard and the Fords and the whatever, and also the other, the intermediary organizations very enthusiastically to talking about it, but it's very difficult to break those boundaries and talk about field building and, and putting, you know, creating those collective spaces. So in the end, we seeded that project on our own and raised it painfully. And then finally, when it took a little bit of shape, we started to get other, other donor engagement. I can't tell you why that reluctance, I guess is because of the, you know, because of the, 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 the strategies the donors have and the interest each of them has. And somehow we are not able to bring and elevate this conversation to, to, to that. I, I have no idea, I, I, can't, I can't answer why, to be honest, I can, I can only guess. So it's a work in progress. We can all put our heads together to try and figure this thing out a little bit more clearly. Um, would anybody else like to comment on this? Anna? Yeah, uh, thanks, Aruna. Uh, so it's, it's kind of difficult to think about, you know, collaborations in a context of scarcity. So how do we shift, you know, from, from that scarcity to, to abundance? And, 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 and I think that is the challenge. Uh, and, and, and something that we've been thinking a, a lot about is how do we move from competition to collaboration? And there is a particular example, um, uh, it's called the Women's Funds Collaborative, which is an initiative formed by four private foundations uh, together with uh, the funds, which are members of Prospera. 
Uh, it is a, a fund created for the institutional strengthening of women's funds, um, where you know we have worked really hard together, uh, all of us, uh, to create a non-competitive process where you know funds would be distributed equally across the network. But one thing that is key for that to work has been participatory grant making mechanisms. So where you know the community itself. Uh, decides how to distribute the money. Uh, and this is what the community has asked for. Um, and I'm sure Melanie can also speak to, to, to this, you know, the Equality Fund, they're also, you know, uh, they just launched uh, a new uh, funding stream and they're also trying to, uh, you know, opt for a non-competitive process. Now, uh, funds are not limitless, money are, uh, you know, the resources are not limitless and sometimes decision have to be made, but, uh, you know, participatory grant making mechanisms um, uh, help to engage the community and to work together with the community and, and give the responsibility to the community to decide by itself uh, how it does uh, and where, where resources go. Um, so I, I don't know, Melanie, I'm sorry, I put you on the spot there, but maybe you want to add something from, from your experience. Um, Melanie, if, if I could just ask you to hold, I'm going to turn to you for the next question because we're, we're um, running close to time now and we've got some still some important questions um, that are coming up. There's um, one question now which really goes to the heart of um, the whole question of sustainability and it's about um, it's about how do you build the capacity of feminist institutions in a way that sustains those institutions when you're focusing specifically on individual staff members building their capacity and then um, they leave as happens with all organizations and particularly in, in some contexts where um, women's rights organizations, the staff in those organizations then move on to you know, joining <clears throat> better jobs at donor agencies or international organizations. And so, so when we focus specifically on what, you know, individual organizations that may be grantees, then um, that sort of that institutional memory, that institutional capacity can easy, easily be lost when, you know, there's a transition. Um, and so that again points to this whole collective resource mobilization question. It goes back to that. It's linked to that. Um, and so I'm going to give you a chance now, Melanie, if you could jump in on, on this one. Sure. Thanks, Edwina. Um, yes. And uh, in, in terms of flexible funding and, um, and, and the funding mechanisms that can uh, best and more, more sustainably support um, organizations, uh, women's rights organizations and feminist movements um, through, through the challenges, through the turnovers, um, I, I guess we were, we were speaking, others were speaking earlier to flexible funding um, and multi-year funding. Um, I, I think those are absolutely essential and, and, and um, exploring and supporting partners in, in their strategies for, uh, for continuity, um, supporting, flexibly supporting um, their investment in, um, uh, in uh, youth leadership, um, and, um, uh, and also the collaborations um, and collective action um, across um, intersectional, um, uh, the most intersectional kinds of work, um, which um, I, I think we were kind of touching on this a little bit before, um, the, um, uh, the collaboration, uh, cross-movement collaboration between uh, groups, which are, are taking creative approaches to, um, uh, to seek funding for, um, uh, for for work that is um, uh, funding, for example, I think you know one of the case studies um, in the um, resource mobilization uh, module, and, and and a partner um, uh, who who uh, we we are currently working with newly United Sisterhood Alliance. I think is a really interesting example of um, uh, of uh, a group in in Cambodia um, supporting um, uh, and and. Uh, 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 um, sister um, coalition of uh, sister member organizations um, uh, uh, representing uh, different precarious workers. Um, I think this this kind of uh, inter intersectional um, approach um, is. Um, I think it's uh, really a, a space that we are interested in exploring. This kind of coalition work um, as well, and I, I don't want to leave out some um, the other. Um, 
the other uh, piece of, of the question, uh, which is the, um, the the space for rest and recuperation and um, um, and and sustain organizational sustainability. So I think uh, in uh, what this pandemic context has uh, particularly highlighted, um, you know, a, a long existing phenomenon that we need to become increasingly clear um, and. Um, and uh, fund uh, with with rigor um, the the um, uh, work for feminist leadership and collective care practices that um, uh, will allow um, uh, our uh, these organizations to um, to be sustainable uh, to look down the road um, with um, uh, uh, multi year strategies. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a really important point, Melanie. And I'm wondering if if you all, I, and, and maybe ask Nina this question very quickly, if you've thought about, um, or if there are examples of a, a kind of a support organization that can do this, um, in a way it's called, it's housekeeping work. It's sort of holding these, these different pieces together that different organizations can use, that different organizations can you know tap into so that they're not always the ones who have to bear the burden, their own individual burden on their own individual journey um, to, you know, to be able to fulfill these kinds of roles. Can you say that a slightly different way? I'm not quite sure. Um, it's, you know, the, the question really is, is, is about um, how can you build that capacity, when you build that capacity and then it leaves, what do you do? So, you know, can you build that capacity in a kind of a central place that can support a range of organizations. Sure. I think we have to, I'm really aware of time, so I'll be very, very quickly on this, but I think we have to think about capacity building really widely. I think we have to really think about, you know, uh, not just skilling up individual leaders, but skilling up whole organizations. Then we have to think about, you know, skilling up between organizations. So this is a challenge for us as funders, perhaps uh, as well to think about, you know, or meeting organizations kind of uh, asks on, you know, as there are a lot of demand for like wanting to know advocacy, can you bring partners together? Can you move funding towards women's funds so they can do this work? Can you move funding, you know, to, to bigger groups to meet the smaller groups needs uh, and help them through that? And I think that's a journey that we're on as issues affecting women that we're team that we're really trying to kind of put money in more communal hands as well to sort of try and uh, address this problem. But also whilst meeting individual needs, there's, there's that balance, it's a tension. I think I talked about it in my example. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you so much, all of you, um, for your, your insights, your comments, your examples. You know, um, it's been a really, really rich discussion and I really wanna thank you all very much. I'm gonna turn it over now to Bettina to wrap up the webinar. Thank you, thank you so much. I will, before I wrap up, I will say, I want to just plug, of course, we want to fund organization to be, not just to do. And that does include making sure that um, people's benefits and salaries are relevant so that they want to stay in those organizations. And I will also say that the toolkit has a specific um, uh, part on succession planning, which is a really important part also of enabling organization to renew themselves with their uh, with their talent. Anyway, I just want to say a very, very big thank you again for everyone um, joining us today. The link to the um, website where you can download the Fox toolkit is in the chat. I know there's been some chatter about having issues with that and Lisa has posted additional information about who to get in touch with uh, in terms of uh, if you have any problem accessing it. Importantly, in the spirit of uh, properly valuing feminist knowledge creation work, we have a sliding cost scale to ensure these resources are fully accessible for grassroots organization. Uh, for small and grassroots organization, the toolkit is completely free, and we ask larger organization and even individuals who have some resources to make a small contribution if you can, so we can um, support the access for all. Importantly, uh, I encourage you to download the resources, but also we're really keen to hear your feedback. And so we're keen to actually revise the toolkit for the demands of a post-COVID world and add further tools to the package. So if there are any donors attending today, and I know there are, and you want to contribute to enabling a FOX 2.0, 
please get in touch with us. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And we wish you all the very best um, as your organization change and as you take your organization on that change journey. Thank you.